Well, first let me just say uh, it's very good to be back here in Doha and especially to be with my colleague and my friend, the, the Prime Minister. Uh, as you heard him say, we were together just yesterday in Jordan at a conference to work to rally more international support to address the dire humanitarian crisis in Gaza. Uh, Qatar has already shown remarkable generosity in helping people in such urgent need, uh, providing 4,700 tons of food, medicine, and other life-saving aid. Uh, at yesterday's conference, I announced uh, $400 million more in additional support from the United States to the Palestinians. That brings the total amount that we've uh, provided to $670 million in additional U.S. assistance uh, to uh, the uh, Palestinians in the eight months that this war has been going on. We've long been the leading provider of support to Palestinians, and we will continue uh, to do everything we can to support them, particularly in this time of, uh, of need. We're also continuing to work every single day on increasing the flow of assistance into Gaza and making sure that it gets to people who need it within Gaza, working to improve civilian protection, working to secure the release of hostages. Now, the single most effective and most immediate way to end the suffering of people in Gaza to end the suffering of Palestinians and Israelis alike, to tackle the humanitarian assistance crisis, to prevent the conflict from further escalating and spreading to other places, is to get a ceasefire that allows us to get to work toward a more durable end to the conflict. Here again, Qatar has been a tireless partner, and the Prime Minister personally, a tireless partner in working to mediate a ceasefire and a hostage release. Uh, it's something that the Prime Minister and I first discussed here on October 13th and many times since. Twelve days ago, President Biden set out a ceasefire proposal rooted in core principles of releasing all the hostages, surging assistance into Gaza, guaranteeing Israel's security, providing a path to an enduring end to war, and starting the massive reconstruction for Gaza. The entire world, almost without uh, fail, has been uh, behind this proposal. And we've heard it again and again and again. Individual countries pronouncing themselves in support in this region and beyond. Important groups like the G7, the Arab League, uh, Palestinian Authority, Israel, and of course, just two days ago, the United Nations Security Council. Leaders in the region that I've met with uh, over the last couple of days they have reaffirmed that again and again and again. So we were waiting on one response, and that was the response from Hamas. And as the Prime Minister said, uh, last night we received a response. Hamas has proposed numerous changes to the proposal that was on the table. We discussed those changes last night with Egyptian colleagues and today with the Prime Minister. Some of the changes are workable. Some are not. Here, in a nutshell, is where we stand. A deal was on the table that was virtually identical to the proposal that Hamas put forward on May the 6th. A deal that the entire world is behind, a deal Israel's accepted, and Hamas could have answered with a single word, yes. Instead, Hamas waited nearly two weeks and then proposed more changes, a number of which go beyond positions that it had previously taken and accepted. As a result, uh, and you heard the Prime Minister say this, uh, the war that Hamas started on October 7th with its barbaric attack on Israel and on Israeli civilians will go on. More people will suffer. More Palestinians will suffer. More Israelis will suffer. But in the days ahead, we are going to continue to push on an urgent basis with our partners, with Qatar, uh, with Egypt, to try to close this deal. Because we know it's in the interests of Israelis, Palestinians, the region, indeed, the entire world. And we all agree that the deal has to be grounded in the principles of the ceasefire proposal that the entire international community supports. 
There's something else that's critical, and the Prime Minister alluded to it. It's also crucial that we get from the immediate ceasefire that we're working urgently to achieve to an enduring end. And in order to do that, and to do that effectively, um, we have to have plans for the day after the conflict ends in Gaza. And we need to have them as soon as possible. For months, we've been working with partners throughout the region on such a plan. And that was also a key focus of conversations I've had over the last couple of days. In the coming weeks, we will put forward proposals for key elements of a day after plan, including concrete ideas for how to manage governance, security, reconstruction. That plan is key to turning a ceasefire into an enduring end to the conflict, but also turning an end of war into a just and durable peace and using that peace, using that peace as a foundation for building a more integrated, a more stable, a more prosperous region. Over the course of uh, what's now my um, eighth visit to the region since October 7th, everyone that I've engaged with has made clear that this is the path they want to pursue. Now, I can't speak for Hamas or answer for Hamas, and ultimately, it may not be the path that Hamas wants to pursue. But Hamas cannot and will not be allowed to decide the future for this region and its people. As a, um, when I was in Jordan, I believe it was on my last trip to the region, it may have been the one before that, uh, I met with um, a remarkable group of women who had managed to leave Gaza uh, to get out, uh, are now in Jordan, uh, but have left family members behind, have lost family members, and I heard directly from them everything that they'd experienced and everything that their family members who remain in Gaza continue to experience. In the United States, I've met with um, Palestinian Americans who have family uh, in Gaza, uh, including family members who've been killed or terribly injured over the course of these eight months. Um, I carry with me um, a little pamphlet that one of, um, one of these um, individuals gave me with pictures of his family members, including a little one-year-old boy who was killed in Gaza. And I have to tell you that their stories, their suffering, that motivates me, just as the suffering of the hostages and the suffering of those who were slaughtered on October 7th motivates me to do everything possible to bring this conflict to an end and to put us on a path to durable peace and security. Because at the end of the day, this is exactly about what you've suggested. It's about the men, the women, the children, whether they're in uh, Gaza, uh, whether they're in, um, in Israel. Uh, and we have to. We have to be looking out for them. Um, and I've said this before, but I'll say it again. The, the biggest poison in our common well that we all have to drink from is dehumanization, the inability to see the humanity in someone else. And when that happens, when hearts get hardened, it's very hard to do anything. It's very easy to justify anything. So we have to push beyond that. And the most important way to do that is to always have in mind what little girls, little boys, women, men are going through as we speak. For you, despite your intense efforts to pressure Hamas, they obviously don't seem to be accepting the deal as President Biden laid out, and the Israelis are character characterizing this as a flat-out rejection. Does Hamas's response count as a rejection of the deal in your view? Do you think the deal is essentially dead? 
And if not, what exactly is the U.S. diplomatic strategy now to try and keep these talks uh, alive and bring the parties closer together? And secondly, the U.S. has put all the emphasis on pressuring Hamas, uh, at least publicly. But do you think it might be time for the U.S. to put more pressure on Israel to move them closer towards accepting the permanent ceasefire that Hamas has asked for, even if that allows the group to survive in some form? Uh, and Prime Minister, um, even with the elaborate three-phase deal that's being created to try and bridge the divide between Israel and Hamas, we still seem to be stuck on the fundamental question of a temporary versus a permanent truce, um, which is effectively, will Israel allow Hamas to survive this? Do you think these negotiations can really be salvaged, and what is the risk to the region if these talks continue to fail? Thanks. Uh, thanks, Ian. Um, look, as I said, based on what we saw last night, um, the response from Hamas. Numerous changes proposed to the deal that was on the table and that the entire world has gotten behind, but some of those are workable changes. Some, as I said, are not. Um, I don't want to characterize it further, but, you know, at some point in a negotiation, and this has gone back and forth for a long time, you get to a point where if one side continues to change its demands, including uh, making demands um, and insisting on changes for things that it already accepted, you have to question whether they're proceeding in, in good faith or not. But based on what we've seen and what I've discussed with the Prime Minister and what we've discussed with our Egyptian colleagues, uh, we're determined to try to bridge the, uh, the gaps. And I believe those gaps are bridgeable. doesn't mean they will be bridged because, again, it ultimately depends on people saying yes. But here's the thing, and we both said it. The longer this goes on, and remember, Hamas had this for 12 days, and it's not as if the world stood still in those 12 days. People were suffering throughout those 12 days. Uh, the longer this goes on, the more people will suffer. And it's time for the haggling to stop and a ceasefire to start. It's as simple as that. Um, look, Israel accepted the proposal as it was. And as it is, um, Hamas didn't. So I think it's pretty clear what, uh, what needs to happen. And we're determined in the, in the coming days to, again, try to work this. We will work this with urgency and see if the gaps that, that are, are workable, we can actually work and bring it to conclusion. And then it may be that Hamas continues to, to say no. Well, I think it will be clear to everyone around the world that it's on them, and that they that they will have made a choice to continue a war that they started. Regarding, I think, <coughs> your question. Can be a deal that can be salvaged. What gives you that hope? Thank you. Thank you. Look, as I said, we have a proposal that President Biden put forward 12 days ago. Um, Israel accepted the proposal. Uh, the entire world got behind the proposal. Hamas came back and has now asked for changes to that proposal. And I'll repeat what I said. Some of the changes um, I think we believe are workable, but some are not. Uh, and so we'll have to see over the coming days uh, whether the, the gaps that are there as a result of Hamas not accepting uh, with a clear and simple yes proposal, whether they can be bridged um, or not. And as I said, I believe that they are bridgeable, but that doesn't mean they will be bridged, because ultimately Hamas has to decide. But I'll repeat again what I, what I said before. Uh, the time for decision is now. The longer this goes on, the more people will suffer. And when it took 12 days just to get the response to the proposal that President Biden put forward, Suffering, more suffering took place during those 12 days. The longer this continues, the greater the suffering will be. And I fully agree with the Prime Minister. The, the fastest, most effective way to get to not just an immediate ceasefire, but a durable one, is through this proposal. So let's see if we can uh, bridge the remaining gaps. But fundamentally, uh, Hamas has to decide what it wants, and I can't, uh, I can't speak for it. When it comes to um, 
the, uh, the war and the conduct of, uh, of the war um, in response to the attacks of October 7th. Uh, we look and continue to look very carefully at internationally humanitarian law, at laws of armed conflict, uh, human rights, and we have a number of our own processes within the U.S. administration, including within my own department, to um, assess whether Israel or any other combatant in any other conflict is adhering to those. And as you know, uh, we put out a report uh, a few weeks ago that went through in some detail uh, a number of um, in incidents that have been raised, uh, both in terms of the um, loss of life and killing of uh, people, as well as the provision of humanitarian assistance. It's a very well documented report and we continue to do the work to make our own assessments. I haven't seen the most recent, uh, the most recent, I think you said UN report that you referred to, but of course we'll look at that. Um, again, the, 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 uh, as I just said, uh, we are determined and insist that Israel or any other country adhere to uh, international humanitarian law, the laws of armed conflict, uh, uphold human rights, uh, not c does not commit uh, gross violations of those uh, of those rights, uh, and that remains and will always remain our policy and the focus that we bring to it every day, including doing our own investigations of uh, of incidents that come up in the course of this war. But I think that. <coughs> I have answered partially uh, your question regarding, uh, you know, trying to build the momentum to reach a deal. Of course, this is, you know, uh, it has been a very uh, long process. Uh, it's frustrating a lot of times. And uh, we have seen, I mean, uh, the behavior from both parties in different, different occasions being, uh, you know, counterproductive to, to the efforts. Right now, we are respecting our role as mediator. We are trying our best not uh, uh, to consider ourselves as, you know, party of, of that uh, conflict. What we are aiming for is one specific goal is to end the war and to end the suffering of the people in Gaza, to get the hostages back. And then we think about the day after. That will remain our main focus. We are not going to give up on that mission as long as we see a role that we can play and we can contribute to save more lives. So, Rabba, Daphne Saladakis, Reuters. Hi, thank you. Secretary Blinken, do you agree with Israel's assessment that Hamas rejected the deal? And what specific changes were proposed by Hamas? What specifically do you find workable and not workable? Can you confirm that Hamas wants written guarantees from the United States for a permanent ceasefire and the withdrawal of Israeli forces from the Gaza Strip in order to sign off on the proposal? And can you provide those guarantees? And then if I may on Hezbollah, you've repeatedly said that achieving a ceasefire deal could help end the fighting between Hezbollah and Israel. Hezbollah today vowed to increase the intensity of its operations against Israel after the killing of a senior commander. How concerned are you now after Hamas's response to the ceasefire proposal that this conflict will spread? Uh, and Prime Minister, given this response, is there more pressure the Arab world can put on Hamas to reach a deal? And are you considering closing the Hamas office in Qatar? Thank you. So what we received last night, all of us in terms of the response from Hamas, were um, changes that they sought and they seek in the proposal that President Biden put forward that Israel and the entire world has accepted. Um, so the question is whether any of those changes that they have sought they seek are workable, um, bridgeable, or not. And I'm not going to obviously character, characterize or describe uh, what, uh, what they're looking for. Um, all I can tell you, having gone over this with our colleagues, is that we believe that some of the requested changes are workable and some are not. And so we have to see on an urgent basis over the course of the uh, the coming uh, the coming days, um, 
whether those um, those gaps are bridgeable, in, again, uh, in a way that um, upholds the the agreement, the proposal that President Biden puts on the table. Because uh, again, we're not. This is not about changing fundamentals. It's about seeing if we can bridge the uh, the gaps that have been exposed by Hamas's response. And I can't can't tell you right now whether we'll succeed. I believe it's doable. Uh, I believe it's absolutely necessary to try our hardest to do it, but there's no guarantee. Uh, with regard to Lebanon and, uh, and Hezbollah, look, we've said from day one that one of our primary objectives is to prevent this conflict, the conflict in Gaza, the war in Gaza, from uh, spreading, seeing escalation in the region, and we've been on that from day one. Um, we don't want to see that escalation. And I think it's also safe to say that actually no one is looking to um, start a war to have uh, escalation. And I think it's also true that um, most involved uh, believe that uh, there can and should be, ideally, a diplomatic resolution to the differences that could spark conflict, and in particular, um, a resolution that uh, leads to the necessary conditions for people to be able to return to their homes and believe that they can live safely and securely in their own homes. There are about 60,000 Israelis who've had to leave their homes in northern Israel because of the uh, rocket attacks and, and the threat from Hezbollah. Um, they have to be able to go home. There are people in southern Lebanon who've also had to leave their homes. They should be able uh, to go home. So what I've heard from uh, everyone concerned and, and, and others who are working on this for every concern is there's a strong preference for a diplomatic solution. Now, there's no doubt in my mind that the, the best way also to empower a diplomatic solution to the north, to Lebanon, is a resolution of the conflict in Gaza, getting the ceasefire. That will take a tremendous amount of, of pressure out of the system. It will take away a justification that Hezbollah has claimed for the attacks it's engaged in, uh, and I think open a pathway to actually resolve this diplomatically. That's what we're determined to do.